Returning to the live portion of our show, I have a new guest to introduce. Please welcome the director of, of, of the Hawaii State Department of Human Services, Kathy Betts. Aloha, thanks for welcome, having me. Kathy. Welcome, Kathy. I'm so glad you're able to make it today. But before we jump into your interview, Linda and I wanted to first embarrass you just a little bit and publicly congratulate you as the Hawaii Women's Legal Foundation's 2021 recipient of the Rhoda Lewis Award. In normal times, we'd be at a big party to recognize you with the Rhoda Lewis Award, named after the first female member of the Hawaii Supreme Court. This award is annually presented to a woman attorney who has devoted, devoted her career to public service. Consistent with the spirit of this award, you truly embody someone who has toiled in the trenches. One of the quote, unsung heroes who has worked to improve the lives of women and children in Hawaii. I wanted to give um, Linda an, a, a moment to say anything she'd like to say to you. Congratulations, uh, Director Betts, this deserve I, I, this award is going to go to anybody more deserving. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you both so much. So much appreciated. Thank so, you. So the three of us, I think, have like um, walked the journey of being attorneys, law students from UH Law School. But Kathy truly has just toiled in the fields first as a law student, as a Mink Fellow, as an attorney general, as the first, uh, as an executive director of the State Commission on, on the Status of Women. Deputy Director, you've done it all, Kathy. Um, any takeaways, any reflections you have for a young female attorney out there? Um, two things, hard work is hard work. You just gotta put in the time to make it happen, um, to, to make things happen quickly. And um, don't be afraid of, of trying because you won't find out if you're successful if you don't try. Two things I try to wisdom. Thank you. <laughs> Complete words of wisdom. Thank you so much, Kathy. So let's jump into your interview. Um, you lead a very important department, um, especially now more than ever. We're seeing record use of the safety net programs that your department oversees, um, SNAP, early child care programs, and so much more. Can you start off, uh, start off by giving us a brief snapshot of what it is that the Department of Human Services does and how it helps people? in the community, uh, maybe with the general assistance program first. Sure, Representative, thanks for that question. You know, it's a very large and complex department. We've got four divisions, um, attached agencies, attached commissions, staff offices statewide, uh, usually around 2,000 employees statewide as well. So it's a large, a large uh, department. For general assistance, it's um, a program that provides cash benefits for food, clothing, shelter, and other essentials to adults ages 18 through 64. Um, that don't have children, don't have minor dependents, but are temporarily disabled and unable to work. Um, they probably do not qualify for Social Security. Um, and so they have to actually, in order to be eligible, they must have little or no income and not qualify for other federal assistance. Um, and then they also have to be certified by a DHS medical board to be unable to engage in any substantial employment for 30 hours or more. Um, so these are folks that get monthly payments um, uh, from the Department of Human Services, 100% state funded, general funds. Uh, and we are experiencing about a 30% increase from this time last year. So, so, the, so can you yeah, discuss the urgency with addressing uh, general assistance benefits during this pandemic and maybe within the next couple of weeks or, or um, a month or so? Sure, because of the pandemic's impact, on economy and the need for folks to have access to more benefits from our department, we've seen a surge in applicants for general assistance, um, such as at the point that we're, we're almost exhausting the funds to support the GA program. So as of uh, December 2020, we had about 6,700 individuals receiving GA, which as I mentioned before, is 30% up from this time last year. And so uh, we do need um, an emergency appropriation or some of our bills to pass through the legislature this year in order to ensure that there's ample funding to support uh, general assistance program moving forward. So that's general assistance, but you have other programs. Can you tell me a little bit about um, the SNAP benefits that you folks also provide? Sure. So our SNAP benefits, we were really able to, um, I know that everybody uses the word pivot 
a lot these days, but we were really able to adapt. We applied for uh, federal waivers and successfully received them to expedite benefits. So those are supplemental nutritional assistance program benefits or what, what they were formerly known as food stamps. So that's cash assistance on an EBT card for folks to purchase food for their families. Um, we also received two rounds of federal aid called PEBT, so Pandemic EBT for Children, who would be usually eligible for free and reduced lunch. So we dispersed millions of dollars of, uh, of food benefits for families in Hawaii to purchase food. We set up virtual call centers staffed by DHS employees to ensure that residents could get through on the line to check on the status of their applications. Um, and also through the federal government, we were able to implement a SNAP increase of 15%. So folks will get the maximum amount possible for their households. And that started in January of 2021, and that'll go through June, 2021. Uh, Chair Ichiyama, did you wanna weigh in on, in, in on any of these? Because I know that food insecurity was a concern in the early part of the pandemic. We saw a lot of food drives. Um, SNAP benefits, the, these increases have helped also to ensure food security. Any other thoughts or did you want to jump in on anything about SNAP I just or, wanted or food to insecurity? Thank Director Betts because um, all, all of the constituents that I've referred um, to SNAP have been very thankful that their applications have been processed in such a quick and efficient manner. And I think that really speaks to the hard work of your team um, and staff on the ground for turning around these applications so quickly. Absolutely, Representative. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we were able to adapt, adapt very quickly, and especially thanks to the legislature for your sound wisdom in providing us CRF funds to, to really be able to pivot to telework and ensure that folks, you know, anybody else during a non-pandemic, they would just have their personal cell phone, not a, a work cell phone or a work laptop for home, et cetera. So it made it very difficult in those first days to really ensure that our staff had all the tools and technology um, to, to ensure, you know, utmost capacity to serve our residents that are in need. Um, and we were able, able to really um, adapt quickly to do that and to ensure that most of our needy residents are, are taken care of. So thank you. Another area of responsibility for you and your department, Kathy, is early child care programs. And I know, again, this is an area that Rep Ichiyama, Chair Ichiyama, has really been focused on. But can you uh, explain a little bit about the early child care programs that are still in place now? Sure. So uh, we license for the regula regulatory authority for child care providers across the state. Um, early on, we did receive and expend additional child care development block grant funds, which we call CCDBG. I know it's a mouthful. Um, we provided extra funds through grants to child care providers to stay safely stay open or reopen. Um, we waived our income eligibility for child care subsidies, which is a big deal. Um, so those subsidies are, are funds that go directly to families for child care. Um, we additionally received $15 million in coronavirus relief funds, um, and Representative Ichiyama was instrumental in that. So we were able to partner with Hawaii Community Foundation to quickly set up a child care grant program to provide funds to those providers. Um, and as Rep Ichiyama also mentioned, we ensured that um, providers quickly received PPE, so they felt safe reopening or staying open. A lot of our child care providers stayed open from the beginning. Obviously, um, they've had diminished capacity because they have distancing requirements and smaller pods of, of children. So that's made it a, a struggle for this, this, this group of providers. Um, and, and right now we're actively uh, engaging with our providers to ensure that they can be vaccinated so they can also have an extra layer of, uh, of feeling support and, and um, you know, and, and cared for. Because I, I think that there's a lot of focus on educational institutions and people forget that child care providers have been open for essential workers since the very beginning and they go to work and put their life in many respects on the line to ensure our, our keiki are well cared for and loved. Chair Ichiyama, did you want to chime in on any of this, um, the child care programs or maybe what we might be seeing from the federal government or anything, anything on this topic? Because I know this is near and dear to your heart. Yes, it is. I'm the mother of two toddlers and I could not do this job without child care. Uh, so child care is absolutely essential for me. Um, Director, do you have any advice for a parent who maybe needs child care and can't afford it? Um, and whether that might be for a toddler or a school age child, where can they find resources and help? 
they can apply online for child care subsidies. It's um, humanservices.hawaii.gov. All of our services um, and benefits are there on our website. I would encourage them to not, you know, discount themselves as possibly not being eligible for the benefits. I'd say that for any benefit across the across um, our department, that you know, if you uh, think you might be eligible, just go ahead and apply and see. Um, the child care subsidies are there for a reason. They're really there to help support working families that are the backbone of our economy at this point um, and have, have long been. So I would encourage folks to apply online to see if they're eligible. Thanks for that question, Chair. Um, one last area, um, Director Betts. Does DHS oversee any workforce development programs and can you share that information with us? Absolutely. So one of our core divisions, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, or DVR, they provide services to Hawaii community members who experience barriers to employment, such as a physical or cognitive disability. So they are designed to assist job seekers with disabilities to prepare, secure, retain competitive employment in an integrated work setting. So um, we, we are also actively collaborating with Workforce Development Council of um, Department of Labor and Industrial Relations, Workforce Resiliency Initiative. Wow, that was a mouthful. So we're working on retraining, upskilling, and uh, stewarding Hawaii's workforce as we as we adapt to this new time. Um, last item is uh, our First to Work program, which is part of our BESD division. Um, they are just starting a pilot to integrate public health nurse services to address the health and well-being of First to Work participants. Um, their children and their family units. So the target population for these services are participants who are pregnant and those with children between the ages of um, zero and eight years old. Um, and that's a collaborative effort with Department of Health who just recently hired three new public health nurses in November to specifically assign to the first to work pilot. So those are two, um, two units on Oahu that are, that are starting that. Um, I guess last item, sorry, I thought I was on the last item, but I have one more. We're collaborating with the Broadband Hui on their digital literacy and digital uh, sovereignty subcommittees to ensure individuals have access to computers and digital job training. So a lot of interesting collaborative efforts. I think what the pandemic has taught a lot of us is that collaboration is key. Cross collaboration with other public and private sector entities is absolutely crucial to reaching the, the breadth of, of folks that, that really uh, need the assistance at this point in time. You know, that's a great place. And we actually have a, a, a minute or so more. But Cherry Chiyama, did you want to leave um, the public, our audience, with any last thoughts um, you know, about the pandemic, how we're approaching it, how we might continue to approach it as we move forward through the session? Sure. I think that um, you know, kind of tying the two themes together of pandemic response and, and safety net programs is that um, our entire community has gone through an unprecedented trauma. And I think that we all have to be cognizant that the impacts of this trauma are going to be felt for years. And the more supports that we can put around families who are undergoing enormous financial, emotional, mental stress, I think the better it will be for our state in the long run to prevent um, uh, adverse childhood experiences and all of the other social impacts that we know happen when society goes through trauma. Thank you so much, Chair Ichiyama. Thank you, uh, uh, Director Betts. It was really, really great to hear about the variety and the you know, types of services and then the numbers of residents who are really accessing these important services. We'll make sure that they have all of this, uh, all the important contact information that you've given us uh, and we'll connect them with your department. Mm -hmm.